Through you the blind will see, through you the mute will sing, through you the dead will rise, and through you all hearts will praise, through you the darkness flees, through you my heart screams, I am free. You guys believe that? I am free. Let's sing it again. Through you. Through you, the blind will see. Through you, the mute will sing. Through you, the dead will rise. And through you, all hearts will praise. Well, through you. we thank you that we are free to worship you. We're free to give you our heart in its fullest, Father. And as we continue, Lord, we ask you just come and because we surrender ourselves to you, Lord, everything that we are.
the God who comes to save is here to set the captives free. For who can stop the Lord Almighty? Well, our God is the Lion, the Lion of Judah. He's roaring in power and fighting our battles. And every knee will bow before Him. Well, our God is the Lamb, the Lamb that was slain for the sin. Death that claimed its victory. The king of love had given up his life. The darkest day in history. The run across made for sinners. For every curse is blood atone with final breath and it was finished but not the end we could have known for the earth began to shake as a veil was torn Sacrifice was made as the heavens
Sing all hell again. With all hell, King Jesus. With all hell, the Lord of heaven and earth. With all hell, King Jesus. With all hell, the same. Savior of the 
give us dreams and visions Let us see your kingdom Anything can happen in this place Oh, come and break addictions Bring us into freedom Anything can happen your kingdom anything can happen in this place cause healing's falling falling down like rain it's healing's flowing it's healing's flowing We're talking about 
uh, rethinking your life. And I want to talk this morning about changing the way that you think about love. We've been, we've been rethinking different things this, uh, this week and about how to manage your heart and do what is right. And how many of y'all have discovered that love um, isn't all rainbows and pink hearts and stars and butterflies? Love's a whole lot more than that. In fact, love is hard. Some people are in a marriage and they think it's hard labor. There's a couple I heard about that they were having a little wine together. They weren't on somebody's a God couple. They were having a little bit of wine together and, um, and she goes, man, I love you. And he says, is that you talking or is that the wine talking? She says, no, that's me talking to the wine. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> and uh, some of us feel sometimes like that's the marriage that we're in, doesn't it? And, uh, and uh, so, you know, not only that, but if you think about the fact that when you're brought into this world, you're brought in with a great labor of love. I mean, it's just amazing and a uh, great pain. Us men, we don't understand it. We have heard that birth labor pain is horrible, and we think it's kind of equivalent to us having a bad headache. Us men, if we have a kidney stone, a little, actually a little fleck, we call it a stone because we think we're going to die, and it takes five days to recover from that little stone. A woman can give birth and be up walking around that evening, and uh, it's just amazing the difference between the two of us. That's why I believe God has given childbirth that right to women and not to men. My threshold of pain is not very high. Um, on a scale of 1 to 10, I think my scale starts at 10. That's kind of where I'm at. I don't do well with pain. When I go to a dentist, I don't want laughing gas or Novocaine. I want an epidural and because uh, I don't want to have to deal with anything. I don't want any pain whatsoever. And, uh, but how many of y'all have found that love sometimes is a bit painful? There's parts of it that don't seem to work that well, and uh, it's, uh, I mean, we have romance, we talk about love, and we have romance, and that's all nice and wonderful, and uh, everybody loves romance, and God, I think, uses romance to put people together. That's kind of where it starts. Two things like a male and a female, and we're so different, we're like two different species, and then God uses this romance thing to make us certifiably mentally ill, and, uh, and then we decide, hey, I'd like to spend, you know, my life with you, and procreate and all that kind of stuff, and let's get together, and then you marry, and you eat the wedding cake, and something happens. Immediately, there's a change that takes place, and I mean, you try and put your best foot forward, but the other foot comes out as well, and you know, I suggest that when people get married, they get really, really good premarital counseling, and then I say to them, don't eat the wedding cake, because once you eat the wedding cake, something happens. There's got to be something in that cake that makes a difference, that makes us react the way that we do, but people love romance. There's something about that, and, and if you go to any dating site, you'll see this whole thing, and they're, just, they're, they're multiplying like crazy. I'm going to give you one piece of advice if you go to a dating site, and I know somebody who right now is doing that and looking for someone, and I said, always ask for a second picture of that person. I said, and that second picture should have the, the, they should be holding a newspaper with today's date on it. That way you won't go into shock when you really meet them. There's always this unbelievable picture, I guess, on dating sites that when you meet the real person, uh, something else is all there. So I want to talk about rethinking love, managing your heart. And I had to make up four words to do this, you know, because I'm not the smartest tool sometimes. And I mean, who cares? If I make up words, you can just deal with that. So the first one I want you to write down is lordular. Lordular. And uh, love being directed towards God. Lordular. And uh and you might say, Pastor, that doesn't make any sense. Well, it does to me in my way of thinking. And our love should resemble something in that area. And our love must be directed towards God and provided to others in, the, in a form that I think resembles God. It's the number one thing that we need to do is to figure out how to love and how to experience God's love. And it must be all about God. The Pharisees were trying to trick Jesus one day. And I think what a bunch of idiots to try and trick Jesus, but they were trying to. And so they ask him, what's the most important thing? What's the most important thing? And he says this in Matthew 22, 37 and 38. You must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, and all your mind. This is the first and the greatest commandment. So he's saying right there to all of us, let me give you a clue about life. This is a big one. And you love God with everything that you have. Now, let me just say this morning that if you don't get that right, you're not going to get anything really right. You've got to nail this thing down first. 
You have to love him. It's got to be lordly. It's got to be always towards him. And it's amazing to me that the God of the universe, the God who created this, this vast universe, who created this beautiful planet that we live on, the perfect amount of gravity, the perfect amount of everything, he makes these little humans called us, and he wants to love us. I still have a hard time wrapping my head around that sometimes. How many of y'all made mistakes this past week? Raise your hand. I'll take those collections. And uh, yeah, we all probably messed up someplace somehow. And yet God still chooses to love us. He still makes the decision that I want to love you. And he wants to love us and, and he's made room for us in his life. When you think about how many billions and billions of stars uh, that are out there, A.W. Tozer wrote this. He said, it is strange and it's a beautiful eccentricity of the free God that he has allowed his heart to be emotionally identified with us. Self-sufficient as he is, he wants our love and will not be satisfied till he gets it. Free as he is, he has let his heart be bound to us forever. His love is active, drawing us to himself. His love is personal. He doesn't love humanity in some vague sense. He loves the humans. He loves you and me. And his love for us knows no beginning and no end. Man, that's not a profound kind of love. It's a love that we have a hard time because all of us at some point in our life, we say, oh yeah, I love you, but I love you based upon the fact that there are conditions, that if you cross those conditions, I don't love you as much as I used to. How many of you know what I'm talking about? How many of y'all have ever had somebody say, man, I love you all the way, and then you said something and they go, oh, I don't love you that much anymore. You know, and that love, is, but God doesn't work that way. God's love it goes way beyond that. His love is so unconditional. It's active. It's personal. He loves the, even with all of our mistakes. If you don't feel God's love, if you're not experiencing God's love this morning, I want to tell you that there's hope because I believe that you can experience some hope and you can experience some love, even if you were raised in a household where you didn't experience the type of love that God wants you to have. Here's what 1 John 4, 16 through 19 says. It says this, we know how much God loves us and we have put our trust in his love. Now look at this. God is love. That's something you might want to circle. It doesn't say that God's loving. It says God is love. And all who live in love live in God. And God lives in them. And as we live in God and our love grows more perfect. So we will not be afraid on the day of judgment. But we can face him with confidence because we live like Jesus here in this world. Such love has no fear because perfect love expels all fear. If we are afraid, it is for fear of punishment, and this shows that we have not fully experienced his perfect love. We love each other because he first loved us. We love each other because he first loved us. We're not loving because it's a good idea. We're not, uh, that's not why you love. You love because God, the creator of your soul, loves you. And he wants you to experience that, not only in receiving it, but he also wants you to experience it in giving it out. That you understand that type of love. That's why we love. And when we do and when we get it right, we experience something that's far beyond uh, the experience of so many other people because we get to experience this love. Imagine this. If you were raised in a family uh, where, where no one tells them that they, that they have love whatsoever and they're neglected and they're abused, they will grow up and they will tend to be attracted to, to, to what they're comfortable with. And sometimes what they're comfortable with is somebody who's the same way. So once again, they fall, they fall into the same trap, they fall into the same environment, and they never really experience any type of adult love, and they never know what it's like to experience that. I, I've had guys tell me, well, I just can't tell my son that I love him. My father no, never told me. So I can't tell my children. I'm thinking, man, get over it. Your son, break that chain and let your children hear they love you. I remember being embarrassed at times when my mom and dad, when they would come to some high school event, they would give me a hug and say, I love you. But then I realized one day when one of my friends says, man, I would give anything to have a parent say that to me. How privileged I was to have parents who expressed their love. I mean, my dad got kicked off a football field one time because he was shouting so loud at the refs because of a bad call they put against me. And finally, the ref said, who is that man over there? He asked my coach, I asked Fred, do you know who that is? And Fred says, I've never seen him before, something to that effect. And they kicked my dad out of the stadium. Why? Because my dad loved me. 
The last play of the last game that I played was against Rota, Spain, and I was playing middle linebacker. And all we had to do was keep the score where it was at. And the guy threw a ball over, the quarterback threw one over the, over the middle, and I snatched it with one hand, took off down the field, and I got tackled, and we won the game. I asked my dad, did you get any pictures? He goes, no, I didn't. I was running down the field with you. And uh, my dad was running down the sidelines. Why? Because that's my dad. And my dad, to this day, he loves to give me a hug, even though he can hardly raise his arms. So I, he sits there, and I give him a hug. And I tell him, I love you. I tell my mom, I love you. They're, they will listen to this next week. I can make them cry right now if I wanted to. And uh, why? Because there's such a deep love, and that love doesn't even compare to the love that God has for us, the creator of your soul. He loves you. And if it's the way it is, if you don't experience that love, you have to ask why. Why is it that I, what do I need to fix my problem with love? And if we're afraid, maybe it's because of our love relationship with God needs some work. I'm telling you this morning, if you have love issues, begin with him first. Be Lord, you Begin out that direction and watch God do something. What's the second thing? The second thing is be other word. Other word. I'm glad I wrote them up there. Love is not self-centered. It's other word. It reaches out. And um, it's not self-centered. And um, people say, well, we have a Christian marriage. And I, I go, well, yeah, but if, it isn't, if Christ isn't in your marriage, you don't have a Christian marriage. Just because you got married in a church doesn't make it so. And um, Matthew 22, 39 through 40, again, this is Jesus responding to those Pharisees. And he says this, a second. So here's another command. A second is equally important. So Jesus can say here, there's number, this is number two. It's equally important to number one. Love your neighbor as yourself. The entire law and all the demands of the prophets are based on these two commands. So first of all, we talked about being Lord. Now I want to talk about being other word. Here's what I want you to understand. Satan doesn't want you loving God. He doesn't want you worshiping God. He doesn't necessarily want you worshiping him. What Satan wants you to do is he wants you to worship yourself. If, you, if he can get you worshiping yourself, which, by the way, is the world we live in today, it's all about me. If he can get you worshiping yourself, then he's got you right where he wants you. And when it comes to the neighbor, Satan doesn't want you loving your neighbor. Now, I began thinking about this in a little different way this past week, and that is that um, he wants you to have conflict with your neighbor. So who's the neighbor that is close? Who's the person that's not you that's the closest to you right now is probably your spouse. And that's probably the closest person to you, if you're married, that um, you can almost qualify them as your spouse is your neighbor because it's simply not you. And if we're truly going to live the way that God wants us to live, uh, if God's called us to live it, we got to live it. If you're either that or you're not going to do it. And uh, so I've been thinking about neighbor in a little different way. And... You can't say, oh, man, I got the spirit of the Lord in me and not love those around you. And sometimes the hardest people to love around you is, is the people in your house. It's not necessarily the person next door whose dog always barks. Every time my, my, my next door neighbors have a big old Doberman, which I, is a beautiful dog. I've got a little beagle. And when I want my beagle to go out before, before going to bed, I let it out. And every time I let it out, that Doberman barks. If you want to get my dog into the house real quick, it hears a Doberman bark, and it's making a beeline for the door. It forgets all the sniffing around and what it's doing. It's scared to death that Doberman's going to come over and eat it. I don't know what's in its head, but, you know, there's something there. So how do you think other word? How do you come to that point where you see beyond uh, who you are, and you look at those around you? Well, Galatians 5.13 says, For you have been called to live in freedom, my brothers and sisters, but don't use your freedom to satisfy your sinful nature. Instead, use your freedom to serve one another in love. Now, we're either serving someone or we're not. We're either doing things out of love or we're not doing it. Romans 13.8 says, Owe nothing to anyone except for your obligation to love one another. 
If you love your neighbor, you will fulfill the requirements of God's law. So you're not fulfilling the requirements of God's law if you're not loving the very person that you're married to. You might say, well, look, pastor, things have changed in my marriage. Hey, things change in every marriage. That's part of getting old. You would say, well, you might say, well, pastor, you've been married 40-something years. You should, you should have it figured out by now. Okay, wait till you've been married 40-something years. See if you figured it out. It's not that easy sometimes. I mean, if you're in a marriage, it requires work to be otherward in marriage. Someone said that marriage is like a, a license. Marriage license is like a work permit. Well, okay, that can kind of be that true. Someone said also that it's like a deck of cards. All you need are two hearts and a diamond. And then when you're married, you're looking for a club. And if things don't look change, you're looking for a spade. So, uh, I don't know. I heard a story about a guy who was pulled over by a policeman, and the policeman looked down, saw a marriage ring on the guy, and, and he says, well, I see you're married there, so you know that everything you say can and will be held against you. And uh, you got to look otherward. you got to realize there's something different about what takes place. My wife, Paula, and I, Paula's going to be gone next week, so I have responsibilities that I don't want at the house because she's going to be on vacation down in nice sunny Texas enjoying that. But um, you think you know everything about your spouse till you eat the wedding cake. And then something new takes place. And I discovered that Paula was born with a birth defect. And uh, I was going to share this for next Sunday, but because uh, she wouldn't be here to give me those dirty looks. And, uh, but she has no compass. Is that true? She has no sense of direction. She doesn't even know what the word compass. She doesn't even know what a compass is for. And uh, she has no sense of direction. I mean, the best gift I've ever given Paula all of our years married is I gave her a GPS a couple years ago for Christmas. She goes, "This is the best thing you've ever given me." And she loves having her GPS in her car because if I say, "Hey, honey, you just need to go northeast," it's like, "What does that mean?" Northeast, no clue where we're going. And um, and here's what I discovered: it's not my job to try and fix her. Just buy her a GPS and let God do the rest. And, uh, you know, because it's not my job. That's God's job. My God job is to try and help her be what God wants her to be by letting God do it. How many of y'all have ever tried to change your spouse, thinking you're helping God? And that doesn't work real well, does it? And uh, you don't do that. So I, I was going to try and think of some of my faults, but I couldn't find any, so we're just going to move along And uh, this morning. And... Uh, I'll share those next week. So, uh, so being otherward doesn't mean fixing the other person. I guess that's what I'm trying to say. And uh, it means that we have to fix me. And we have to come to a point where we do, then, then we do for the other person what God desires. But it's not about fixing that person. It's about fixing us. If you get two people that are otherward, they're looking out towards what God has looking out. You get those two people acting together, they're going to have a great relationship. Because they're doing exactly what God wants. What's number three? Number three is this. Number three is be volitionful. Yeah. Love is full of willing acts of choosing to act. Volitionful. And uh, you can tell that I had time on my hands when I wrote this message. Sitting there in my office thinking, what can I say here? And uh, it's easy to say you love. It's easy to talk a good game in the Christian community. But what are you doing to push out that direction? And uh, I've heard people say, well, you know what? I would die for my children. And I, my often thought is, well, it's probably not going to have to happen any day soon. So my comment is, would you live for your children? Not be willing to die for them. Would you be willing to live for them? Would you be willing to come to a place in your life where you put down the alcohol? Where you stop the pornography? Would you be willing to come to a place where you quit the affair, where you're home rather than being somewhere else, where you'd be present for your kids, where you would live for them, being volitional, being volitionful, because your life becomes full of things that you can point to that show that you're a person that really loves them. You know, my, I told you that my parents, my parents were, were fantastic for the high school that I went to. Because so many of the parents were always working. They weren't there for the football games, the basketball games, the soccer games. My parents made all my games. That was very important to them. 
And by my senior year, a lot of parents followed that same thing because they watched my parents do it, and they saw the impact it made on me as a kid. Not only that, but if we won a game, I got a steak dinner. That's right, at the steakhouse. If we lost a game, I got chicken. And it became kind of a thing. After the games, a lot of the families would get out and they'd go out to eat. If we won my senior year, I got steak every meal. Never lost a game in any sport. It was a good year. <laughs> I ate a lot of chicken my junior year. And, uh, but it became a thing where other parents saw what my parents were doing. And it made a difference in life. John 14, 24 says, anyone who doesn't love me and will not obey me and remember my words are not my own. What I'm telling you is from the Father who sent me. And remember, my words are not my own. You say, well, I don't even know how to love God. Well, let me tell you something this morning. You love God with acts of willful sacrifice and obedience, understanding who he is. Obedience isn't just for pets. It's also for us. The Bible says in 1 John 3, 17 through 18, if someone has enough money to live well and sees their brother or sister in need but shows no compassion, how can God's love be in that person? Dear children, let's not merely say that we love each other. Let's show the truth by our actions. So if we're going to show it in the same way, what is it worth? Does it have any meaning? How do you do that? I'm going to go back to my marriage. <laughs> After I married Paula, I discovered something. I discovered that we had a slight difference in communication style. If I was a superhero, I would be known as bullet point man. That's right. Just put a bullet, or just put a little target right there, and bullet point man is who I would be. Because when it comes to my life and communication, I would just want to dot on my cape. All I want to know is the headline. I want to know the bottom line. The devil's in the details. I'm not so concerned about the details. I just give me the facts and let's go with it. But Paula's a little bit different. Paula, when she communicates, she starts with a prelude. And then there's a building up of emotion. And then we have this crescendoing to the climatic moment of full, rich expression, of feeling and drama. And then there's a closing. And then we kind of have a resolution to the piece and we come down to the finale with a postlude. And, uh, and that's her love language. I want bullet points. Give me four things. Tell me what they are. How do I do it? And I'm good to go. Paula likes that, all the other stuff. She wants to be listened to. She wants to be heard. So I've discovered something after 40-something years. When I listen to her, I look at different parts of her face. And uh, I don't look away. I stay focused. I pay attention. I don't roll my eyes. I don't look the other way. And guys, I've learned that there's a, if there's a complaint or something and you think you've got to explain it, you've got to defend yourself, no matter what she says, don't explain, don't defend yourself. You do this. Is there more? And you ask that question. And when they get through talking, you say, anything else? And then when you're done, she'll say, no, no, that's fine. It's, it's just I wanted to get it off my chest. And guess what? You're, all, you're off scot-free. She's got it off her chest. It's all taken care of. And um, just try it. Because if you're saying, I'm going to, let me explain this to you. They're thinking, she's thinking in her head, he's an idiot. Just quit it. Just listen to me. That's all there is. Paul, isn't that true? <laughs> you see, there's something about the, the fact that she simply wants to be heard. And the problem I think so often is, is most of us don't ever want to listen. It's hard to listen. And I'm not just talking about marriage. I'm just talking about any conflict you have. Coming to a point where you can just listen. And here's the deal. If you want to change, because you see, love encourages. Love serves. 
The Bible says that love leads, love gets help, it meets needs, it doesn't criticize, it doesn't blame, shame, hate, hit, ignore, deceive. If you're either loving or you're not, you can't fake it. Because through the rough times, that's where it's at. You're either saying it, you're doing it, or you're not. And you cannot say that you're a person who is experiencing God's love without living it that way. I want to live out what God has. I want to live out that experience. So I want to challenge you this morning, be be volitionful. Come to a point where when you do when you when you realize that you love is full of it's a full of willful acts, choosing to act in the best interest of somebody else. When you do that as an individual, you'll grow like crazy. When you do it as a church, it's even more amazing. <laughs> it's hard to get a drink with a top on. I think the crown, the crowns, the clowns rattled me this morning. And uh, so don't be somebody who merely does the easy stuff. Do the difficult stuff. Realize what it's like. Let me give you one more this morning. Be everything jickle. Everything jickle. Okay? Love is the greatest of all acts it, um, and the highest of all attainments. If you miss love, you're missing out on everything. And it doesn't matter here. If you don't leave, if you don't leave here wanting to experience God's love, wanting to share with other people, then you need to ask God to do something in your life because it should be something where it touches everybody. Let me read you 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 3. If I could speak all the languages of earth and of angels but didn't love others, I would only be a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. If I had the gift of prophecy, and if I understood all of God's secret plans and possessed all knowledge, and if I had such faith that I could move mountains but didn't love others, I would be nothing. If I gave everything I had to the poor, even sacrificed my body, I could boast about it. But if I didn't love others, I would have gained nothing. Everything you go. Coming to the point where it acts out. Everything that, uh, every, give everything away for whatever reason, but if there isn't love involved in it, then it's worth nothing. If you miss love, you miss everything. That's the point. If I could put it into a, something that we would understand this morning, it might be this. If you went to every Chick-fil-A restaurant in the world and you only ordered the charbroiled chicken, you've missed the whole point of Chick-fil-A. Okay? I mean, it's about the fried chicken. It's inspired by God, I think. And uh, fried chicken. The charbroiled is simply for people who have almost died already. And... Uh, but if you want to experience true Chick-fil-A, it's not the charbroiled. It's their fried chicken, especially those little nuggets and the chicken sandwich. I would say let's all go there, but they don't open on Sundays. It's like going to Haagen-Dazs and ordering Jell-O. You've missed the whole point of what's taking place. So here's what I'm telling you. If you miss out on love, you've missed out on everything. Love has got to be the bottom driving line for everything that you do. It simply has to come from there. Love is the greatest of all acts, is the highest of all attainments. You've got to have the love of the Lord, and it's worth every bit of effort. Because when you begin to experience God's love, you begin to experience who He is. 1 Corinthians 13, 13, three things will last forever. Faith, hope, and love, and the greatest of these is love. A lot of times people, they don't really reject Christ. You know what people reject? They, they reject some of us that follow Christ because they don't see the love that we talk about in God's love. People say, well, you know, I got hurt by the church. I'm sorry that, that happened. But I will also remind people that every single person in here is imperfect, striving to understand the love of the Lord. Amen? There are going to be times when we are all going to hurt each other. It's called the porcupine dance. You know, we, we want to snuggle up, get each other, but when we do, the quills pop out, and we hit each other and back off, and we do a little dance through life. I've yet to find anybody who's in 100% agreement with me all the time, or I've been in 100% agreement with them all the time. But we still have to operate in love. We have to be people who live out Jesus we become his hands, we become his feet. 
We become what God wants. What is it you could do like that that you might surprise somebody right now in your life by simply living out that love, by such an affirming act of love? What if you did something uncharacteristic and you just did some act of love? And they said, man, I realize you love me. Let me give you one last, I think, astounding scripture. It's Romans 8, 38 through 39. And I am convinced that nothing can ever separate us from God's love. Neither death nor life, neither angels nor demons, neither our fears for today, nor our worries about tomorrow, not even the powers of hell can separate us from God's love. No power in the sky above or in the earth below. Indeed, nothing in all creation will ever be able to separate us from the love of God that is revealed in Christ Jesus, our Lord. You don't have the power to get God to stop loving you. No matter what you do, he's still going to love you. That's simply who he is. There's nothing you can do to stop God's love. He absolutely loves you, and nothing will end that for you. It's so powerful and pervasive in our lives, the love of the Lord. And if you don't experience it, then surely there's something that can be done to repair it. I finished last week's message with kind of three things to manage your mind. I want to I share with you kind of the same thing, three things for your heart. Because if you're not experiencing God's love this morning, maybe it's time to feed your heart three things. Feed your heart God's truth, His Word. Feed your heart, time with God. Maybe get involved in a small group where people can become the flesh of Jesus and they can pray for you. And you can share things that maybe you wouldn't want to share with an entire church, but you can share with a group of people that it'll stay right there. I think God wants you to know that you don't ever need to be feel left out. And I know that there are people who come to church at times and they feel left out. If you feel left out, come and tell me. Because I want you to feel you're in. This church is here for you. It's for what God wants to do. So if you feel this morning that your heart is not free and you feel shame this morning, I want you to come to a point where maybe you get off the self-worship and you come to a point where you focus your heart on obeying God and letting him come into your heart and, and give you what he desires that kind and gentle love that only comes from the, from the Lord. I know I made up some words this morning, but if you look at the first letter of each word, it forms the acronym LOVE. And He loves you. What am I willing to do to experience God's love? You know, if you go to Outback Steakhouse, they, um, they serve those deep-fried onion blossoms. Man, those go straight to the, to the... I think they have defibrillators at Outback just for people who pass out from eating those, and they jumpstart them and put them back in their seats, and, uh, you know, and then they order more food, and, and, I mean, you can't save everybody, but rather than take them out front... Take them out back. Here's the deal. Sometimes in your life you have to say no to things that, man, they sound fantastic, but they simply aren't good for you. And sometimes you need to say yes to things that you really don't want to obey it, but you know you need to. So I'm telling you this morning, there are certain things that come into your life right now that maybe in relationships that you have, you're upset still, and you're saying, no, I'm going to hang on to my, myself if this is one. I'm telling you this morning, you probably need to let go of it. And then there are things that are in God's Word right here that talks about love that you probably need to say, yes, I'll take that, and I'll accept that. And I'll become that person and let God begin to do a healing in your heart that really only God can do. He's the only one that can do it. So get rid of some of the stuff that's destroying you, and Accept some of the things that God wants to do in your life. So I want you just to bow your heads for a moment this morning. And I want to ask you, before you partake of communion, maybe you can say, Pastor, you know what? My life has been more self-centered love than God-centered love. I have been looking inward, not outward. 
And this morning, I want to try and change that in my life. I want to be the person that God wants me to be. I want you to raise your hand. I want to pray for you this morning. Yes, 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 yes. I want to be able to look outward, not be self-centered. Maybe you're here this morning and you realize that your heart, your life is far away from God. There might have been a time in your life in the past where you gave your heart to him, but honestly, if you looked at your life this morning, you're not really walking the way that you should. And today you're coming back home. You want to say, Jesus, I want to accept you as my Savior again. Anybody here before we pray? Yes. Anybody else this morning? So, Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. I am thankful, dear Lord, for your love. We come before you because we desire, dear Lord, to to live out the love that, that you desire in each of us. A love that the world will see, dear God, and maybe be drawn towards you. So, Lord, may may our love be directed towards you. May we start there. May it resemble your love towards us. May it not be self-centered, but rather, Lord, may it be a willful act of of reaching out to others in the way that you desire. Dear Lord, I ask, may you help us uh, see see through a filter of love in all that we do that comes from you. May you guide us. May you direct us. May you help us be the people that you want us to be, that we might walk in your love and walk in your obedience. Walk in your obedience. I ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen.